Okay, so when you we go live, yeah. All right, hey everybody, welcome to Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas. My name is Tyler Pearson, Program Officer with Heifer USA. Today we are going to be talking all about lambing season. You can see here behind me, I'm joined with my colleague Christine Hernandez and over almost 200 baby lambs uh, and their use. So we are going to be talking all about everything that we did to get ready for lambing season in this video, what we do during the actual lambing, and what we do after lambing is over. Some bonus tips and tricks on all the things that we're going to do to get ready for next year. A lot of great valuable resources to share with you at the end of this video to help you continue on in your lambing journey. As always, we're going to be taking your questions live throughout the broadcast. If you're watching the recorded version of this video, just type your questions down below in the comments and we will answer every single one of them. This is a community event. We want you to be a part of the show, so please ask away with those questions. Let us know where you're watching from. Say hi in the chat. Let us know if you're raising sheep yourself and what type of breeds. We would love to hear about your operation as well. We want to learn together and grow together. So I'm going to turn it over to Christine. We are going to get started in today's video talking all about lambing season done right here at Heifer Ranch. Christine, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm so excited for this live stream. I've been waiting for weeks, and it is a beautiful, glorious day, yes. and everybody looks happy and healthy. Uh, so tell me all about your operation here in this flock. Sure. So welcome to our pasture, everybody. I'm so glad you were able to join us. So behind me is our entire sheep flock minus the rams. So we have 106 ewes, and those ewes are a mixture of Katahdins and Katahdin Dorpers. Um, we started with the Katahdin breed, and then we added in a Dorper ram two breed seasons ago, and so we have a little bit of Dorper influence. Um, with that, we have three rams. Two rams are pure Katahdins, and then one ram is pure Dorper. So that's how we're, we're integrating those two breeds. Both the Katahdins and the Dorpers are hair breeds, so we don't have any wool. We don't have to shear or anything like that, which I absolutely love. And so as we're walking around today, you might see some of them. They are starting to shed their winter hair. Um, so they'll put on a nice, thick hair coat for the winter time so they can stay warm. And then as spring is here, they're going to start, that hair's going to start loosening and they're going to start shedding it. So they will rub up against our fences or our trees or our gates. Um, and then you can see some of them, it's just falling off like in, in mats. And then I'd say within the next month, they'll all have shed their hair. They'll be nice and slick and ready for the warm Arkansas summer. Um, let's see, the other most important thing that we have out here would be our livestock guardian dogs. Uh, they are the protectors of our flock. They take care of business while we're not here. So we have Sam and Uno out here. Um, they are with the flock majority of the time, um, you know, keeping predators away and things like that. And so we have the sheep in one section of this bigger pasture right now. So we do rotational grazing with our sheep flock, multi-species, so they will follow behind our, our steers or our cattle. Um, and so we use poly wire, poly posts, you know, solar chargers, and that's how we are able to intensively rotate them throughout our pastures. So right now, our sheep flock, we are moving them about every day to every two days. Um, and so it's a lot of setting up fence and taking fence down. But we want them to go and get the best forage possible and then move them off of there so that forage can rest and regrow and be ready for the ruminants to come back and graze that. Um, and so with that, we do have temporary waterers that will be moving around with them. So they have water in every paddock. And then we also, behind me, you can see um, we have a mineral sled. So this black tub over here is where we put our salt and mineral. So an important thing about that is that we offer free choice salt and mineral. They have it available to them all the time. Um, so they can come and get it as they want. So the ewes can get it, and then I have it open so the lambs can also come and eat it too. So we have loose mineral. Okay, we buy this from our local farm store. It's important that you give sheep sheep-specific mineral. Sheep uh, cannot have cattle mineral because they have a copper toxicity, um, and cattle mineral has high levels of copper. 
So we have sheet mineral that is loose. If you offer the, the block of mineral, you know, they don't have a rough tongue. So when they lick it, they'll have to lick it a lot in order to get some of the, the minerals off of there. And then you never know how much you're actually consuming. Are they getting enough of those essential minerals? And then we also offer a free choice salt so they can choose between mineral or salt. I'm going to jump in Go here ahead. real quick, folks, and just say hi to some of our audience and let you know about a couple of things. I want to say hey to uh, Katie Brown from Urbana, Illinois, Sharon Redinger, K Kansas City, Missouri, Delany Trusty, uh, Hillsborough, Missouri, Luis Rodriguez. Uh, I saw a wine guards in here, Stephanie oh. Weingarts, North Branch, Michigan. Thanks for tuning in. Everybody who's watching, thank you so much. Uh, we have so much that we're going to talk about in today's live stream. Uh, Examples that we're going to show you, you know, physical examples. We're going to get close as we can to the lambs and the ewes. We're going to, hey, there's a, a, a guardian dog checking me out. He's like, what are you doing right now? Uh, but there's so much that we're going to cram into today's live stream, so stick around. Lots of great resources. We're going to do a merchandise giveaway at the end of the live stream, so uh, hang out with us. You won't want to miss what's going on. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, want to let you know about this mineral feeder if you're interested in learning more about mineral feeders we just published a video here on our YouTube page yesterday all about uh, mineral feeders that we're using in our cattle operation and also with our sh this is the old one from this the cows? This was from the cattle I they got the the cafeteria style so I took this one I washed it out and we're just using it for sheep. Awesome. So if you're new to Heifer USA and this is your first time here, subscribe and like the channel and uh, check out all of our other videos. We have a ton of great content on pastured poultry, pork, cattle, sheep, horticulture, uh, organic gardening, and so much more. Uh, subscribe to the channel. You might just see your name pop up on the screen saying thank you so much for subscribing and uh, like this video to help more people see it. Tell your friends about these live streams. Ask your questions in the chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, turn it back over to Christine. Um, so one last thing about the salt and mineral feeder is that, yes, the cattle were using this and it worked great for them. Um, this flap does go down so it gets protected from our spring rain and things like that. It keeps our mineral and our salt dry. So that will eliminate any waste due to that. So last year we were just using like the blue barrels cut in half or like rubber bowls so whenever it would rain you know we either wouldn't give them salt and mineral or we'd have to dump that rain water out and it was you know just a waste of, of salt and mineral so with this we can hook it up to our gator and ju just pull it to the next paddock our sheep are moving to very cool yeah i love that you're repurposing that from uh from the cattle and putting yeah. that to good use sheep are moving away from us <laughs> i know i know you want to go over there and check them yeah, down a little bit there. yeah okay um so this live stream is going to be all about lambing um so i went ahead and i digested some of our records and i'll show you my record book a little bit later um, but to kind of give you an idea of how our lambing season went so today's april 1st i was expecting our lambing season to go until about april 10th but we have not had a lamb born since march 16th we have had all of our lambs born within 27 days of the start of the the lambing season which is insane i've never had such a short lambing season before and so all the all that work and labor you know was condensed and i love it it was fantastic so i will try and tell you how i did that <laughs> um but just a little bit of of numbers for you guys so we started lambing on february 18th and our last lamb was born on the 16th of march we have 106 ewes out here, and 100 of them have already lambed. So we have six other ones that either are not bred or are going to lamb, you know, within the next nine days. I'm not, you know, marking them off just yet. I'm hoping we'll have 100%, but the chances of that, you know, are unlikely. So that's a 94% lambing, 94% of the ewes have lambed. That's awesome. Yes. Um, and so out of that... 100, 100 ewes, we've had 198 lambs physically born. And so that's a conception rate of 187%. And normally I would shoot for like 160 to 170%. So, you know, we, we surpass that. Everyone's goal while you're lambing should be 200%. You want, you know, every ewe to have twins. That's how you're gonna, you know, be the most profitable 
with your sheep flock. The likelihood of that, you know, isn't, isn't all that high, but 187% is fantastic. Um, just real quick, you mentioned the livestock guardian dogs. Yeah. Uh, they're a little bit closer, so we can maybe yes. introduce them and let folks Let's know maybe about them. Try. Yeah. Um, so this run right here laying down, that's Sam. He's our male. Hey, Sam. Um, he's neutered. And then that one over there, that's Uno. Um, she's our female. They do both have these new collars on with like GPS tracking. So we can like, see where they go during the day and kind of follow their trail and how they um, do their perimeter checks at nighttime. And so they, you know, mesh in with the flock. They actually help us move the sheep flock sometimes. So if the dogs follow us, the sheep will, will follow us into a new paddock or into the corral or anything like that. So um, they are friendly dogs. They will bark at vehicles that drive by or people they don't know, but we want to be able to handle them. So they do go to the vet, you know, get their vaccines, they get flea and tick medicine. So they are, um, a great addition to our flock and we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without them so cool you mind if we walk and talk and maybe yes. try to cut it cut them off a little bit and, we'll do our best yeah <laughs> it's just it, you know it's just not the same if they're on a bunch of why do a lamb stream if you can't hang out with all the lambs so i want to try to get closer to them for you guys yeah uh tons of great information christina sharon thank you so much this is awesome and so before we like jump into the actual lambing event uh, we it's important to talk about you know pre-lambing what do we do to get ready for lambing and one of those most important things would be our breeding season and so the ewes will not cycle until the days are short so in the fall time so we will take our ewes we'll separate them into three separate groups according to our records um, and then we'll put one ram in with each group. This past year, I did 40 ewes with our two bigger rams, and then our smaller ram got 30 ewes. Um, and they obviously did a great job according to our numbers. Um, we left them in there for three heat cycles. So each heat cycle is 17 days. So they're in there for, for um, three consecutive heat cycles so that they would hopefully cover everybody. Um, after that, you know, we pulled the rams out and then we just let our ewes gestate. So they are, um, their gestation length is five months. And during that time, you want to make sure that, you know, you are feeding them properly. So the lambs are going to grow the most during their last trimester. So during those last, you know, five or six weeks is when those lambs are going to gain a lot of their weight. And so making sure that your sheep flock have the proper nutrition during that time is the utmost important. Um, there are a few metabolic diseases that sheep can get, you know, if their nutritional needs are not met for them or for their lambs. Um, and those would be pregnancy toxemia and milk fever. Um, and we can talk about how we treat those a little bit later. I brought some things down from my office. Okay, I'll jump in here yeah. real quick with a quick question. Sure. Um, Katie Brown asked uh, how you feed the dogs. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're a little far away from it right now, but we have a, a metal feeder. It's a, like a bulk metal feeder. It holds a five gallon bucket of dog food. And so we move that around with our, flat, with our flock. It's on the outside of the pasture where the sheep cannot get to it. Um, the dogs will come in and out as they as they want, and then they can eat, you know, whenever they're hungry. So they always have food available. Awesome, yeah, great question. I, I, I let me ask. I see one black one. Yes. Is that is that, is that very normal? <laughs> no, uh, no. So yes, that is the black sheep. I don't, sheep I, I don't know flock. if you guys can see, but he's way over. He's way over there. We'll walk a little bit. I'm just so um, curious. Yeah. Well, and then its twin is a solid brown lamb, mm -hmm. and its mom is a solid white ewe. And so it was just awesome when I found them one morning. Um, but they are both females, so I'm going to keep them in our flock just because, you know, every flock needs a black sheep. Yeah, right? right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the records are good, so that's another reason <laughs> to keep them. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so, so we did our breeding, you know, the ewes are gestating. There he goes. We talked about, you know, feeding them. 
what they need during their last trimester of gestation. Also during that last trimester of gestation, so four to six, four to six weeks before your lambing season will start, which will be 147 days after you put those rams in. Um, so you want to vaccinate your ewes. And there's only one vaccine that's universally, you know, re not required, but highly recommended. Um, and that's the one we use. So that's a CD and T vaccine. There is a three way and an eight way. We use the eight way. There's a number of other vaccines that you can administer to your flock, but you really need to think about is the cost of, of vaccinating and the labor to vaccinate all these sheep worth worth it you know if your flock hasn't had any issues with what you're vaccinating for if that makes sense so for example you can vaccinate for a sore mouth um i believe there's a mastitis vaccine and, and other things like that so we only vaccinate for c d and t which is the clostridial diseases c and d and then tetanus and so we vac you want to vaccinate your ewes four to six weeks before lambing so that they can give um, protection to the lambs through their colostrum when they're born. So um, the antibodies do not transfer over the placenta, so the lambs don't have any protection immediately after birth. They won't get that until they consume that colostrum from their use. Um, awesome, yeah, I'll take a couple of questions real quick. Sure. Um, let's see, Nathan McCarty wants to know, um, how do the dogs go in and out of the paddock yeah. without letting the sheep out? Well, so the dogs, they can, like, they climb through the barbed wire, you know, like one foot and then their head and then the other foot. Uh, mm -hmm. They do it very, you know, gracefully. Um, they can also go through our gates a little bit, and then they'll go through our electric fence without messing it up. Um, How do they, do they go under it, over it, or what do they do? I've seen them go over it, and then I see them go through the barbed wire. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, there's a, a large hole in the barbed wire, or you know they get some of their hair on the barbed wire, the sheep can go through there. Um, so if the sheep see hair on like a barbed wire fence, it's kind of like a, hey, you can get through here sort of signal. So uh -huh. making sure that doesn't happen. And you you had some issues with that earlier today. Uh some yes. Sheep, sheep getting out a little bit. So these sheep were being a little naughty today, um, and they ended up where they weren't supposed to be. Through a hole in the barbed wire fence. So. I just, I just want to uh, get over here to this, uh, yeah. this, this fence. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fencing, but we'll show you up close just in case you haven't seen something like this before. You want to describe this? Yes. Um, so these orange posts right here, these are Gallagher brand. I, th these are my favorite posts. Um, we have a few different brands as well. So we have um, the O'Brien posts and some other ones, but these are nice and sturdy. Um, the metal spike is really thick. Uh, so it's easy to put in the ground and it's already pointed and so I use these for the sheep and for my pig enterprise. Um, there's multiple notches on here so you can put your poly wire at whatever height it needs to be. So these are very universal with all the species. Um, the sheep right now require three strands of poly wire. We had it down to two strands for a long time but during the winter um, they kind of learned that they, they could go through there and two strands just was not keeping them in. Um, so any fence, whether it's, you know, poly wire, barbed wire, um, high tensile electric wire, all of those are just psychological barriers for the sheep. So they need to be trained that they can't go through there. Um, you know, woven wire, field fence wire, they, they physically can't get through there. But, uh, you know, we, we kind of take that risk with using the poly wire and we use our bigger pastures that are surrounded in either field fence or the barbed wire, and then we just section them smaller with our poly wire fencing. Awesome, cool. Thanks for showing us that. Yeah. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, this is from Edwin Fye. He wants to know how many times do sheep give birth a year? Um, so we have our flock only give birth once a year. Um, so, I mean, you could push them a little bit harder but your use would not, you know, last as long for you. Um, so their gestation is five months. And then, you know, you need to have that breeding season in there. So you need to keep your rams in, I would say, at least for two breeding cycles. So that's two cycles of 17 days. Um, 
And then it also depends on your flock and how you're managing them on when you're going to wean your lambs. You know, if you're going to wean them early. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> She's one of our triplet moms. Oh, I see. Yes. Um, so if you're going to wean them early, you know, and she can get her body condition back and stop lactating, then you could breed her again, but you would probably need some sort of injection to have her cycle again. And so, um, some people do fall lambing, so they would breed in the spring. And so that's going to require, you know, some hormone injections to have them cycle. So we, we do it naturally. Um, you know, we, we wait for them to come into heat. We use the ram so that it's natural breeding. Man, they, they, sure, <laughs> yes. they sure tug away, don't they? Yes. They're, they do what they got to. Um, so this is 2029. 20, mm -hmm. She has triplets. There's only two of them here right now. Um, I think the other one's out there a little bit more. Um, I don't know if you can still see it or not, but the lambs have red paint on their sides, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But you can see, like, she has a nice udder. Um, she has good body condition, so she can definitely handle raising triplets out here. And if she can count to three, then that is, you know, very impressive. That's awesome. Uh, Nathan McCarty just subscribed. Thank you, Nathan, for subscribing to the channel. We appreciate that. Um, we're going to take uh, some more questions here in just a minute. I think we got a few more things that we're going to talk about with regard to like before lambing, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And then, um, and then we're going to jump into what we actually do when they lamb. We have some stuff to show mm -hmm. people. Do we need to make our way slowly yeah, back over can. there? All right. So we're going to answer a few more questions uh, here in just a minute about pre-lambing. Christine has a few more things to talk about. Yeah. Um, so for pre-lambing, you always want to think about where you're going to lamb. So our flock is 100% pasture based. You know, we don't have a barn for them to go into. They don't lamb in a barn. They lamb out on pasture. They're out on pasture 365 days a year. And so it's important for me to know where I want my my lambing season to begin according to the pastures. You know, so you want to look for a pasture that doesn't have very much like water or ravines in it because you don't want a ewe to go and lamb next to that water and have the lamb accidentally get into there. Um, you know, you want that pasture to also be able to rest during the winter time so that they are lambing on good forage. Those ewes are gonna need to, to be consuming good forage for their milk production to keep up their maintenance. Um, and then also, you know, the lambs are with their ewes all the time. They are learning what they should graze and what they should not graze. And they will start nibbling at that grass at just a couple days old. And so I was out here with the sheep, um, yesterday it was, and one of the lambs is just sitting out here ruminating and chewing his cud. So his rumen is already developed um, by eating this grass and then also nursing off of their mom. Awesome. Um, and then this will be a good segue into what we're going to look at, but you also want to make sure that you have all the essentials already purchased for your lambing season. So you have your lambing kit ready um, and anything else that you may need for the actual lambing season. Make sure you already have that bought and in hand before your lambing season starts. All right, cool. So um, Christine just mentioned a lambing kit. We're going to show you that in just a little bit, show you all the the gear that she keeps inside her magic box to bring out to the field when the lambs are starting or when the ewes are starting to lamb. And uh, so we're going to show you that in just a little bit. Let's go ahead and jump in here and answer a question. Uh, Piney Woods Farm and Ranch wants to know, in general, how often do you rotate your sheep? So we are moving them, you know, every day to every two days to a new paddock. And so we take our bigger pastures and we will section them off with our poly wire um, and then just move the ewes and their lambs through that. Um, it's really difficult to tell somebody like what size paddock they need or how long their sheep should stay in there. You know, that's something that, that the farmer, that the shepherd needs to, to learn over time by observing their sheep. You know, pay attention to what's in your pasture before you put your flock in there. You know, as soon as you put your sheep in there, hang around for a little while, see what it is that they're going for first, because that's going to be the most paddable at that time of year. That's what they like. And then when you move them, you know, see what's left behind. Just because there's green grass out here doesn't mean that the sheep are going to eat all of it. Um, some of it, you know, may be too mature for them and they're not going to eat it. 
Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for the great question, uh, Piney Woods Farm and Ranch. If you guys are just joining us, uh, we're talking all about uh, lambing sheep here at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas. As you can see, we're joined by over 100 ewes and almost 200 lambs today. Uh, I'm Tyler Pearson. This is Christine Hernandez. This is your chance to ask an expert anything you want to know all about lambing. Uh, and raising sheep out on pasture. So if you would like to ask a question, just type it in the live chat. If you're watching the recorded version of this video, you can just type it in the comments and we'll answer you later on. The recorded version of this video will be available for later viewing to anybody who wants to watch it. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and then you will be able to find that more easily. Uh, we got a lot more to come. We've covered pre-lambing. We're gonna start talking about what we do when they actually start to lamb. Uh, we got some more stuff that we're going to show you, some merchandise to give away at the end of the broadcast, so stick around. we got a lot more to cover. I'll turn it back over to Christine to jump into lambing. Yes, lambing. Okay, so, you know, our, our pre-lambing is done. You have everything you need. Our lambing season is getting closer and closer. So you should have March on your calendar, you know, when your lambing season is going to begin. And you will know that date by when you put your rams in with your flock. There's a ton of sheep gestation tables out there. They have all those dates lined out. Super easy to, to figure. Um, and so you want to get your flock to the pasture you're going to lamb in, or if you're going to lamb in, in a barn or anything like that, you want to get them to where they're going a few days before that lambing season is supposed to begin. Um, I like to do it, you know, the day before, two days before. Um, so we have everything already set up. And then you just want to be observing your flock. Um, the ewes are going to show signs when they're getting ready to lamb. And so it's it's pretty easy to see. Um, a few signs are that the sheep are going to be restless. So they may be laying down and then standing up, you know, quite frequently. They will try to get away from the flock, you know, lamb not around everybody else. Um, once they kind of pick their their nesting spot where they're going to have their lambs, they're going to stay there. And the other the flock, you know, may be grazing and move around them. And that's okay. You just need to watch out for other ewes that try to um, steal other lambs, uh, which we can talk about in a little bit too. But so they will, you know, look uncomfortable getting up, staying down. They may be pawing at the ground. Um, they may do a Fleming, so that's where they take their upper lip and curl it out. Um, and then you will see like some mucus discharge or their water bag. Um, you don't want to like break their water bag or anything. I just do a lot of observing. And so once they're showing those major signs of lambing, so once that water bag appears, you know, you should be seeing progress every 30 minutes. Typically, after that water bag has appeared, you should have a lamb on the ground, you know, within 30 minutes to an hour. Um, but if you are, you know, seeing that water bag in just a hoof or a nose or anything like that, and she's not making any progress within 30 minutes, then you will need to catch her and, and go in and see what's going on. That, may, that lamb may be presenting abnormally, so she may need some assistance. Um, and how, how often do you, do you usually have to jump in and assist? Um, this year, out of uh, 106 lambs, out of 100 ewes that have lambed, I've only had to assist once. Oh, nice. Um, and that's a crazy story, if you want to hear that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. Okay. Oh, no, it's, I think it's cool. Yeah. So, um, we had a yearling, a maiden ewe, so she was born last year, so she's just a year old. Um, she was in labor and when I found her she already made a ton of progress so the lamb's head was out and one leg but nothing else um, but it looks like she had been in labor for a long time so like the head was dried off um, and the face was really huge because she had been straining to, to push that lamb out and so I caught her and I pulled that lamb out for her that lamb came out at 17 pounds and and tell folks what a normal Insane size would be a normal size would be like eight pounds wow. like eight nine ten pounds this lamb to a year old you was 17 pounds i named her louisa um, <laughs> but she became a bottle baby and she's now at a good friend's farm have you ever seen anything that, no, that large that was the biggest lamb i've ever seen wow it's yeah 
One to remember. One for the record books. <laughs> sounds, sounds like it. Awesome. Okay, let's, let's jump in here and see if we got any more yeah. questions. Uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking all about lambing at Heifer Ranch and lambing season. Joined with Christine Hernandez, who is our livestock specialist for raising sheep and pigs and so much more here at Heifer Ranch. She has a ton of knowledge, so this is your chance to ask an expert anything you want to know about raising sheep or lambing out on pasture. Uh, we do have a great question here um, from Alan Duncan. He says, I would like to know um, uh, how do the lambs handle cold and rainy weather? Excellent question, and um, we had an issue with that this year. So we started lambing February 18th, um, and three weekends in a row. So the first two weekends of lambing, you know, we had ice storms here in Arkansas. And so, you know, um, it was really cold, freezing rain, and then we had another instance about a week later where it snowed a couple inches. Lambs are born with a certain amount of brown fat. So, you know, as soon as they're born, they can start using that fat, you know, to keep themselves warm, to stand up and to nurse. As long as you have a good you, you know, that isn't mismothering, she should be licking that lamb off, getting that lamb dry, getting that lamb to stand up and nurse. Um, it will be important like during those severe weather instances to keep a close eye on everybody. Of course, we had new lambs born during that crazy weather. Um, a few things that we did was we used one of our chicken schooners that was empty. And so we brought that over to where our sheep were. We put hay in there so the ewes could get in, in there, um, stay warm, get out of the weather. You know, we would put a few round bales of hay out, roll them out so they could get on top of the hay. Um, and then we also used some of our pig huts. Um, you know, there, there are six feet by 11 feet. And we put some of those out there too so the ewes and lambs could get in there um, you know as long as as long as the lambs have full bellies they're getting colostrum the cold you know they should be able to withstand that cold um, it's if you know they're not they're not full belly that they'd go into hypothermia and we can talk about how to save a lamb from hypothermia when we go see our things uh, but something I'm going to add to my lambing kit next year due to the rain and the wind is going to be Shearwell raincoats for lambs. Um, they make these clear plastic biode biodegradable coats that you can put on the lambs that will protect them from the rain and the wind. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So yeah, Samantha M asked actually how do lambs weather a heavy rainstorm? Yeah. It's kind of another question. So that'd be one thing that you're going to do. And then the shelters that you mentioned, I'm yes. sure if you need them. Yes. But at this, you know, at this age, they will do perfectly fine. So we had a really heavy rainstorm just the other day. Um, you know, if it's a downpour, the sheep and the, the lambs are going to stay close to their moms. Um, they will more than likely turn away from the rain. So the rain will be hitting, you know, their back ends rather than their face. Uh, if they ha are in a pasture where there's like a tree line or, or some sort of like ditch or ravine that they can get into and have, you know, protection from, from the wind, they'll do that too. Um, but if it's, you know, just a light rain, a drizzle, they're still going to be out there grazing, um, and, and carrying on. Awesome. So we're getting a little bit closer. Uh, we got another question here. Um, let's see. Delaney Trusty says, for a new shepherd wanting to start small, what's the number you would suggest? So that's going to depend on how much acreage you have. Um, you know, just because you have five acres doesn't mean you should be putting two to three ewes per acre. You know, what are you going to do during during the summertime or the wintertime? Um, so you really need to to think about what it is that you already have available to you. Um, a first time shepherd, I mean, you want a, a good number so you can learn. You know, you're not gonna learn until you get hands on. You, know, you could watch these live streams, you could read books, you can do all sorts of things, but you're really going to learn, you know, once you get your hands dirty and you're actually doing it. Um, we have over a hundred views out here and we're gonna be increasing each year, but, I don't know, I think like starting with like 10 or 15 ewes would be a good number, but depending on how much land you have and then are you going to have a ram on site or do AI, all sorts of oh, yeah. variables. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks for the great question, Delaney. And speaking of hands-on experience, if anybody is watching this live stream and you would like to get some hands-on experience, maybe right here at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas, learning 
with Christine Hernandez. We have an amazing opportunity for you. We have a residential training program here at Heifer Ranch where you can come live on site, join our community, get hands-on experience for a month, two months, three months, up to a year. Um, we have a few different opportunities, so we will post a link in the live chat for anybody who is interested in that opportunity, and you can sign up and let us know and reach out to us. So amazing opportunity, doesn't exist many places in the country. You can learn not only about raising sheep on pasture, but pigs, chickens, turkeys, cattle, uh, organic gardening, and so much more. Uh, so check that out if you would like to get some amazing hands-on experience learning from a pro like Christine. All right, so we've talked about pre-lambing mm -hmm. and lambing. Anything else about the actual lambing process you want to cover? Yes. Um, so once the ewe has one lamb, let me back up. Okay. So before the ewe has her lambs, like she's going to be dripping some like mucus and some fluids and things like that. And so that is actually what's going to help keep her in that nesting spot that she chose. So she'll probably be like spinning around in circles, you know, licking that, um, that fluid, smelling it. She's already bonding with her lamb at that point, okay, with the scent. And then she may also be vocalizing, so she'll be calling to her lamb. Now, she's not vocalizing because she's in pain, she's vocalizing to her to her lambs um, and so the importance of that nesting spot is if she has multiple lambs you know she has one lamb already on the ground it's up it's nursing and she has a twin we want to make sure that she stays in that spot um, so she doesn't wander off with her first twin and leave that second one there so that's a Kind of like a fun fact, I guess. Let let let, let me or okay, finish that ahead. thought and then no, I'll jump go. in. Whatever. Okay. Um, so actually, this this reminds me. Um, if you've never seen a sheep give birth before and you want to know what it looks like, we actually have an exclusive video just for our live stream audience here today. And if you stay tuned until the end of the broadcast, we will post a link in the chat where you can go watch a sheep give birth to a lamb that we recorded. I think the video is about a minute or two long. It, it goes pretty quick. It's narrated. There's lots of good information in it. It is graphic. If you're a little squeamish and you don't like to see things like that, don't watch it. But if you're very curious and you would like to know what the process looks like and see it described as it happens, we're going to share a link with you, this exclusive video, just for our live stream audience at the end of the broadcast today. So stick around and we'll share that with you. Catching a live birth can be difficult sometimes. You know, they tend to have them um early in the morning or late at night. So we'll come out here and do our checks. You know, there'll be a dozen lambs on the ground. So that was a good catch by Ruth and Kennedy. Yeah, we got really <laughs> lucky. We, we, I, we, we've tried for a, year, a couple of years now to get that video and we finally got it this year. So really excited to be able to share that with everybody. Um, okay, so your you is in labor. Um, she can have her lamb standing up or laying down. You know, she'll still be restless. She'll be having contractions and pushing. And so she may do a lot of the hard pushing lying down and then stand up and kind of just have the, the lamb f fall to fall to the ground. Um, and so once that lamb is born, she should immediately go to licking that lamb. And so it's going to be covered in some membranes. She needs to go and make sure that that face is cleared of membranes. Um, and then start, start drying that lamb off. And that will help um, stimulate it. To, and it should be standing up, you know, within 10 to 15 minutes. And then looking to start nursing. Um, a lot of people ask, well, is she going to have another one? Um, the, there's a few signs you can look for, but you also never really know. Uh, so she may pass another water bag. If the the water within that bag is a yellow color, then she's more than likely going to have another lamb. If it's more of like a red bloody color, then she's probably done. Um, after she has all of her lambs, she will pass her placenta and um, you know that will just eventually fall out. It's usually really quick, you know within, Within 30 minutes of having her last lamb, she'll pass her placenta. Uh, our dogs tend to eat it. Sometimes the ewes will consume some of it. Sometimes they'll just be, be left out here. Um, you never want to go pull a placenta out of a ewe. Um, you could cause some hemorrhaging that way. You know, the, the buttons within the uterus and placenta need to detach before it can come all the way out. Um, and that would take me to the point where 
no matter what livestock you have, having a relationship with a veterinarian is very, very important. So you can call and, and ask them questions. You know, they can come for a farm visit. You can take your animals to them. Um, I have a few different vets that I use. You know, I've taken some use to them or called them for medicine or for advice. So making sure you have a large animal vet on hand in a relationship with them is really important um, so you can get the medication you need and the advice that you need to. Awesome. Great advice. Okay, we've got uh, several really great questions coming through about the lambing process. Okay. And we'll answer those rapid fire as we walk over yes. to check out the lambing kit. Rapid fire. Okie dokie. Um, well, as rapid fires, you got so much great information, I don't want to rush you through it. Um, okay, Hunter Hobart, why do you lamb in late Feb or why do you lamb in February given the potential for cold? Um, so we are raising our lambs specifically for meat. So we'll be selling our lambs to the Grassroots Farmers Cooperative, and we are aiming to get them to be. They're having a little party at the mineral feeder. Look, at, I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry, Hunter. Fine. We'll finish answering your question, but just check out this little lamb party at the mineral feeder. Do they do that often? Do they just hang out in little groups? Oh and, my gosh, and... that is that is my absolute favorite part of the lambing season. Is these lambs will get into a like a little lamb gang. And they'll do lamb races. You know, one or two ewes are responsible for babysitting, while the other ewes go out and graze. But they will hang out together um, and play and jump, and it's it's a sight to see. It's good life out here at Heifer Ranch yes. for them, I think. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so back um, to Hunter's question about lambing in February or in February. Yeah. Um, so we want to get the we want as much time as possible to get those lambs to 120 pounds. We will process them usually in October, November. Um, last year we were successful in being able to do that. Usually, you know, here in Arkansas, our grass, our spring grass is about ready to start growing at that point, you know, beginning of March. Um, and so we don't have very many mortality issues due to the cold weather or the wind or the rain or anything like that. And I think adding those Shearwell raincoats to my lamb kit next year will really almost help eliminate any um, deaths out on pasture due to those. Um, but as, as long as your ewes are good mothers, as long as they're getting good colostrum and have full bellies, um, you know, they can withstand the wind and the cold. Awesome. Okay, another great question. Uh, Laura McCarty asks, at what age do you begin breeding ewes or ewe lambs? Or when do they turn into ewes? When are yes. they no longer lambs? And when do you start breeding them? <laughs> so technically, all the females are always ewes, whether they're a ewe lamb or a maiden ewe or just a ewe. Um, well, so, she said ewe lamb, so she knows oh, what she's yes, talking about. Yes. I don't. Yes, you do. Good job. <laughs> um, so we will decide who our replacements are, like in the fall time and we will breed the replacements that first fall so they will be you know eight months old um so we have 24 replacement ewes out here in our flock and they you know just celebrated their first birthday awesome cool so guys really great questions thank you so much for asking them uh, we always learn a ton from our audience as well so we appreciate you sharing your information with us um so Katie Brown asked if vet bills are expensive. We're going to answer that and walk over to check out the uh, lambing kit that Christine uses every day during lambing season and show you what's inside there. A um, couple more things to come in the live stream. We got a merchandise giveaway. Going to give away some of these really cool Heifer USA hats. We got an exclu uh, exclusive video link to share with our live stream audience. We got some resources that Christine will recommend to you to carry on in your learning journey. Uh, so some really cool stuff to come. Stick around, and we really appreciate you joining us today and hanging out with all of these amazing animals. I don't know if you can see her, but that you walking away, like she is like heavy shedding uh -huh. right now. She has some of it hanging off, and it's kind of coming off like all in one piece. And then I get startled sometimes because there'll be big pieces of like sheep hair out here, and I'm afraid it's a lamb, but yeah, it's just they're shedding their winter coat. All right, so are vet bills yes. expensive? Um, yes, of course. Any doctor you go to, you know, you need to pay them for their time, for their knowledge. Um, but how yeah. often do you really use them, though? You well, know? see, that's the thing, is that, like, the more time you spend with your vet, you know, the more knowledge you get, um, the more you're going to be able to do yourself. But you do still need to have that 
relationship. You need to pay your vet for their time. And so if we take our dogs to the vet every year for their their annual checkup and their vaccines and things like that. Um, I've taken sheep in there, you know, I've, I haven't taken a pig to the vet. Um, but, you know, once they develop that relationship with me, they're going to be more likely, you know, to, to hurry up and get to the phone when I call and answer my questions rather than just saying, well, we need to see your animal. You know, they may be able to just send me home with whatever medicine I need at that time for my sheep. But yes, vet bills are expensive, but if you have animals, you need to, you know, be willing to harbor that cost to take the best care of your animals as possible. Money well spent. Yes. Absolutely. All right, guys, it's time for show and tell. Oh, yes. Christina's bought all, brought all of her uh, cool items to show you and tell you all about them. Yeah. So where do you want to get started? Um, so before we jump into this lamb kit, so our you has twins on the ground or triplets on the ground. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, both of those lambs are up and that they are nursing off of her. It is the utmost important for them to go and get colostrum. Colostrum is the first milk that that ewe is going to produce. Um, you know, and those lambs need as much as they can get within 24 hours. That's where they're going to get all of the antibodies and that immunity protection is through that colostrum. Um, if they can get it from the U herself, that's better than having to use a colostrum replacement or a powdered colostrum. Um, and then you also want to make sure that she is accepting both of those lambs. You now, she's not mismothering anybody. She's not headbutting one away, but accepting the other. Um, and those are issues that, you know, every flock is going to have, unfortunately, but there are things you can do to help, you know, mitigate that or correct that if that's happening. And is that when Ruth Arnold asked earlier, uh, how do you know if a lamb needs to end up being a bottle baby? Ooh, so are those some of the, the things that you notice? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And so the number of bottle babies we had this year is the most we've ever had. But that is also going back to the fact that we had three like severe winter weather occurrences <laughs> during our lambing season. And so anyone that was like looking weak or if we had a triplet that was significantly smaller than its other two um, siblings, you know, we would pull that one as a bottle baby. If a ewe is not accepting one of the lambs, we will first catch her and her lambs and we will do what's called jugging. So we will put them in a smaller space. Um, right now we have to, to catch them, take them up to one of our barns that has stalls in it. Um, and we can put her like in a head stanchion so that the lambs can nurse off of her, get some colostrum, and then let her out. Usually, you know, giving them the extra time in a smaller space where they're not having to compete with other ewes or, you know, the lambs don't have to try and keep up with their mom. That will help correct those. Um, but, you know, if they're... We, we pulled a lot of babies this year. I would rather have a bottle baby than come out and have a, a dead lamb in the morning if it was showing that it was weak or anything like that. So, and we also had one, one ewe, like she had twins and they would stay with her, but then one would just like wander off and not be able to find its way back. Um, and so we tried putting them together and that just didn't work. So we turned that one into a bottle baby. Um, bottle babies are a lot of work and they can be expensive to raise, but I have three fantastic farms, you know, that will purchase those bottle babies from me and then raise them up you know, for their own markets. Um, so if you have sheep and you have bottle babies, you know, finding someone that you trust to raise those bottle babies would be a good tip. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So where, where are we going to start with the show and tell? Okay. So show and tell. My lambing kit. So this, this black box, you know, it has a lid on it. It can lock. Um, this has everything in it that I take out to the field with me. So this stays with our flock. Um, this is what we're going to use to start our lambing records. So we, I call it field processing, you know, but we're collecting all the data from the new lambs and marking them, tagging them with everything in this box. Um, a, a thing that we do with our flock is that we transport this box to the new lambs. You know, we don't go out and get the lambs and bring them to this box. 
This box is very movable. We want the ewes to stay in their nesting area where their lambs are. You know, she will get a little confused, you know, when we take the lambs and, and do our field processing, but we don't want to make her have to run around and try and find those lambs. You know, we need to be aware of her behavior and make sure that she can hear them and see them and smell them and she's able to interact with them while we are doing our field processing. Um, so first of all, uh, we have our, um, our record binder. And so some things I show in here, if you guys want to email Heifer USA, we can send you um, the record the template, template yep. and, and things like that. So I keep this binder in here, so everything we need. Um, first of all, it would be our U inventory sheet. And so I have all of our U ear tag numbers on here in numerical order. So as they lamb, we cross them off. We know who's lambed, who has not. Um, and I'll tell you a story as to why that is important. So we had her numbers 20, 2007. She had a lamb, she had a single. And then about four days later, she had a new lamb with her. And I was looking and I was like, well, that can't be her lamb. She's already lambed. She stole somebody else's lamb. And it was easy for me to realize without having to flip through all my record pages because her number was already marked off. Um, and then we have that while if they are if they were bred to a Katahdin or if they are bred to a Dorper, so we know the lambs genetics that way. Um, we have a little pencil pouch with some extra pens, a thermometer uh, so you can tell if your lambs are hypothermic or not. You know if they're not doing so well, and then a hoof trimmer just in case a ewe is limping or needs some some hoof attention. I thankfully have not had to use that this year. All right. Um, and this is something we can sh we can send to you. So this is just a list of my field lambing kit. Everything I have in there or have out in the field with me. I have a office lambing kit or supplies that we'll go through here in a minute as well. And then just a list of things um, that you may need for those lambing diseases I talked about earlier. The um, milk fever and pregnancy toxemia. Cool. Yeah. About 10 minutes. Oh gosh, okay. Well, here. Time flies when you're hanging it out. It does. With the yes. Lambs. Okay, we have a lot. Mm -hmm. So, this is just a, a preview of the field records I keep. So, all of this information up top, and this will help me, you know, decide who I want to keep as replacements. You know, make sure all the lambs are growing well, make sure um, all the ewes are being productive, and things like that. And so, um, we also have a note section, you know, um, if one of them has turned into a bottle baby or if one of the mothers isn't like doing swell if there's a reason to call her you know we can put all of that in our notes section i do um make copies of this you know once a week and i keep the copy papers in here and i keep the original records in my office that way you know we can go back and see who belongs to who or if we have any questions we can see that right in the field okay so that's that um so we do weigh all of the lambs when they're born, and this is just a lamb sling. You know, you can get this from Premier One, I think is where we got this one from. You know, they sit in here, and then just a digital fish scale or luggage scale off of Amazon will work. Uh, we want to know their birth weight so that we can see how they are gaining throughout their months here. Um, for ear tags, we have two color ear tags. We have orange ear tags that have um, numbers 1 through 100, and these are specifically for our males. So all of the, the male lambs will have an orange tag. All of our female lambs will have yellow tags. Um, and it's simple enough, you know, all of the, the males are terminal, so they're all leaving anyways, and so there's no need to know what year they were born. We just want to know which lamb it was born at. Um, for the females, we do have the year they were born. That's the beginning number. So 22, it is 2022, so that's their beginning number. And then the next female to be born would be 2293. So she would be the 93rd female born in our flock in year 2022. Um, I special order those, I believe from Jeffers. 
Um, but yeah. And actually, um, most of the stuff you'll see in Christine's kit, we have another video on our YouTube cha uh, channel, and you can find product links to a lot of the stuff, but the video is called something about lambing. I forget the exact title, uh, but we'll link it in the live chat or, or post it later on. Uh, but we do have a, a complete video just about the lambing kit itself that you can check out and get links to all these products and more. Okay. But it has been, it has been updated since that video, so this is a little bit newer information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always add something, that, you know, there's always something to learn, always something to change. There's always a better way to do things, and so this is where we're at this year. Um, so, you know, you might want to make sure you have the correct ear tag applicator with the brand of ear tags that you have. They make a, a number of different brands, so just make sure they are compatible to each other. Um, and then I, this year I added Super Lube to our lamb kit. Um, and it has antiseptic in it. And so I've just been taking a little bit of lube and putting it on both parts of the ear tag before I tag the lamb. And that's going to help with any sort of like infection from the ear tag itself. Um, and then you can also use this, you know, if you have to assist a you, you can use this as well. Um, and so with that, you want to make sure that you have gloves, um, you know, regular latex gloves and then palpation gloves that go up to your shoulder if you need to assist a you in any way. Um, and then we will, if the umbilical cords are really long, you know, we'll cut them down to be about two or three inches from their navel. Um, if they're already that short, then we just, we just leave them be. But scissors in case you need to do that. And then iodine. Um, this is a spray bottle, but you get better coverage if you dip the umbilical cord in the iodine. So I take this. You know, I have the lamb sitting with its back to me, so its belly is exposed. Then you can put the umbilical cord in here and then just tip it over um, and close it against the stomach so the iodine sits on there for a little bit. That will help keep the umbilical cord clean and then helps dry it up as well. Um, Survive, they make a, a few different brands of this, you know, baby lamb supplement or, and things like that but this is just a vitamin e and energy supplement um we would give this to the lambs if they were born under 40 if the temperature was under 40 degrees or it was raining or snowing they would all get a squirt of this in their mouth um and that just you know gives them a little bit of extra energy to make sure that they can stay with their mom and, and nurse and things like that so there's that um Something else that we changed this year, so this is Spray Line. This is Animal Safe Spray Paint, and I have three different colors in our lambing kit. Um, the blue we use for single lambs. So the purpose of this is that we are going to spray the use ear tag number onto both sides of the lambs. And that's going to help us know which you those lambs belong to. So if we, you know, if we have some of them that kind of seem lost, so they can't find their you, we can easily see who they belong to and take them to her or direct her to them. Um, so the blue is for singles, the purple is going to be for twins, and the red for triplets. So that if we have a you out here and she had triplets, you know, they're going to be spray painted with red. That's a bright color that will catch our attention. We want to make sure that she always has three red lambs with her. Um, nice. Same thing with the purple or the blue. You know, if she has twins, they'll be purple. We want to make sure she always has two lambs with her. Two purple lambs. Um, our castration kit. So we use a elastrator and castration rings. You can also buy those, you know, from your local farm store. Um, we castrate our male lambs, you know, when we do this field processing. So they're anywhere from a couple hours old to a day old. Um, the older they are after birth, the harder it is to catch them. You know, they get pretty fast. So we try and do our field processing and our data collection. You know, after they're up nursing, we know that they're doing well. Um, so we will just use the rubber rings and castrate them. You know, it's going to cut off the blood supply to their scrotum and their scrotum will fall off within about two weeks or so. Um, but that way we don't have any misbreeding within our flock. Um, and then we always have towels in here just in case uh, we do need to assist. You know, we can dry off the lambs and things like that. So 
That's my field lambing kit. And something else I added this year was this tall laundry basket. And so when we are processing lambs, you know, if she has twins, we want to make sure that we have both of those twins with us at the same time. Otherwise, she's going to, to go off with the twin we don't have with us. And she may, you know, forget to come get her second one. So we have all of her lambs with us at the same time. One of them will be sitting in this laundry basket as we're doing our field processing with one. And then we'll just swap them out. We will release both of them to her at the same time so that they both go with her. So that's everything in the lemming kit. Yes. And then you got to talk about the shepherd's crook. Yes. I mean, I always thought it was just a cliche thing. No, this is a real thing. And this is the first year I've had one. And I don't know how I've done lambing without it. Um, so I got this from Premier One. It's called the Kiwi Crook. Um, this part right here is a neck crook. So you can catch, you know, a lamb or a ewe by its neck using this, this part up here. Um, something I've used a lot this year, especially if we need to, you know, take a ewe to the jug, um, is this leg hook. And so you can catch them by their front leg or by their back leg, um, but their leg goes in there, like above the joint, and then they can't be released until you unlock it. Nice. Um, yes, I've gotten a lot of practice with that this year. <laughs> um... Before you get to that last basket, or yeah. whenever you want, let me know. Yeah. we got a few more questions. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, got a few questions. Um, Katie Brown asked about the spray paint. She wants to know how long it lasts. So, um, you know, it is going to eventually wear off. Some of our lambs still have it on them. You can't really read it anymore, but it's still, like, visible. And it's going, it's going to last long enough to make sure that you have a healthy lamb, to make sure that the, the lamb and its mom are bonded. You know, it's gonna last a, a couple weeks on there, depending on how much rain and depending on the type of weather you have. Um, but it does, like it will get smeared, you know, after some rain and if they're if they're rubbing on things. So the, it lasts long enough, let me say that. But cool. it's a it's a great tool. I use that for my pigs and stuff too, so. And I'm to tell you hi from Leslie Williams. She <gasps> says she's here in spirit with you. Hi, I miss you. <laughs> um, okay, and so so signs of a healthy lamb would be, you know, they, they're they with their mom. You wanna make sure that they don't have like a hunched back. That would be a sign that they're cold or that they're hungry. Um, you can know if a lamb's belly is full, if like at its spine, near its hip bones, like you reach over and you can squeeze and feel, you know, if they're hollow, then they haven't had enough to eat. Uh, you want it to feel more like a, like a water balloon in there. Um, a healthy lamb, you know, if it's napping and it gets up, it should have a nice stretch to it, you know, stretch and, and yawn. Um, but yeah, anyone that's like hunched over or, you know, calling for its mom a lot, that's going to need some attention. Okay. Next? Yeah. Okay. Okay, right, I'm going to jump in real quick. Yeah. All right, guys, normally we go for about an hour. We're a little over an hour. Thanks for hanging out. Sorry. We got a lot of audience uh, still staying with us, so we're going to stay live. Um, we got some more information to share. This is really valuable stuff. I hope you're enjoying it. And so stick around. We are going to give away some merchandise and share uh, uh, that, that link so you can watch the live birth. Uh, if you're just joining us, you can watch the rest of what you missed later on. This link will be a live, or this will be on our YouTube page after the live stream is over. Yeah. All right. What's left in here? Um, yeah. So thank you all for staying with us. To be honest, I think this might be some of the most important things on this live stream. So the things in here is what I keep in my office, like up at the building. And these are things you're going to need, you know, if you have a hypothermic lamb or if you have a ewe that's showing um, like that twin lamb disease, uh, pregnancy toxemia. You know, these are the things you're going to use to help save both that lamb and that ewe. Um, so I have another laundry basket. This is a short laundry basket and it does have a purpose. And so if we take the temperature of a lamb out on the pasture, anything less than 100 degrees is considered hypothermic. So that does not mean that the lamb is just out there, you know, it's hypothermic from the cold. Yes, it could be, but it could also be like starving. So it doesn't have enough nutrients to keep its body warm. Um, and so, Knowing the lamb's body temperature, you know, that's why I have, you know, half a dozen thermometers 
throughout all of my things is knowing that animals' body temperature is very important. Their normal body temperature should be 102.5. The lambs cannot um, get anything from, cannot get any nutrients or digest any milk if they're below 100 degrees. Yes, okay. So, um, I have this laundry basket and if I have a hypothermic lamb, I'll put a towel on the bottom of this laundry basket and I will hook this space heater up um, and I will put the space heater outside of the laundry basket the, on the opposite end of its head. So more blowing towards its back end. And then you can put a towel over top of your laundry basket because you need to get that lamb warm, um, but you need to warm up the air around that lamb. You know, some people use heat lamps, some people use heating pads, but that lamb, like if it gets too hot, that lamb is not able to get away from that. So we're just heating up the air around the lamb to, to get it to 100 degrees. Um, I also have like a rice bag you could put in the microwave for a few minutes and put that up next to the lamb um, so you know they can they can snuggle with it and also get warm through that. Okay. Did you say at what temperature is considered hypothermic? Less than 100 degrees. Less than 100, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so once that lamb, depending on if you want a bottle baby or not, it's going to depend on like the way you go about this. But once that lamb is to 100 degrees, you need to get some energy in that lamb. And the way that we've been doing that this year, you know, you can have a lamb out here that can't even hold its head up. Um, so you need to get some sugar into that lamb. And you can find this specific one or all sorts of other versions of this, but you need to give an IP injection. So it's an intraperitoneal injection of dextrose and it goes right into their abdomen. So you need a needle and a syringe for that. But you're going to use you know, dextrose at 50% and mix it with fresh boiled water. And this one here, it gives you a graph of how much of each you need in that mixture. Okay. It also gives you a really good representation of where it needs to go and how you need to do it. Um, and it is, the first time you do this, it is pretty scary. Like you're sticking a one inch needle into the stomach of a lamb. But you know, within 20 minutes of a lamb receiving this, um, this injection, you know, they're holding their head up, they're calling, you know, their body's going to warm up and so they can consume milk at that time. Um, you know, practice makes perfect. So make sure you have this stuff on hand. So if you need to do it, you already have the stuff to do it. And then you just need to jump in there and get your hands on. So how often yeah. have you had to use this? Just out of curiosity yeah. th th this year. Uh, I want to say we did this four times this oh, year. Nice. Out of 200 born, that's, yeah. not, that's not too bad. Yeah. Nice. Um, you know, and so you give them this injection. Yep, they're they're getting some some blood sugar. Their body's warming up. After they're 100 degrees, then you can give them some milk. Um, whether you have the U caught and you're going to put that lamb back with the U, um, whether you're going to turn it into a bottle baby, um, whatever you want to do. Another thing to have on hand would be a this is a tube, a lambing tube. And so if you have a lamb that can't suckle, um, you'll put this down the esophagus of the lamb and it has some holes at the bottom okay you'll put that down the esophagus of the lamb and it will go into their stomach and then you can give them um, either powdered colostrum which is what they need for the first 24 hours um, through a syringe that way and then they don't need to like suckle from a bottle um, but that's a really fast easy way to get nutrients into it. You, you add water and mix to the, and then yeah, put it in the Yeah, there's specific directions on here that, okay. that you need to follow. You know, there's all sorts of different brands of that. Awesome. As well. Um, you know, check your lamb's temperature about every 20 minutes after you've done that. You know, they should be gaining that body temperature back up. Um, and I brought this to remind me, you know, if you have a U that lost a lamb or only has a single or anything like that and you're able to it's a really good idea to milk some colostrum out of her and put in a little like ice cube tray that way you have it for any lambs that are going to need that you know colostrum straight from a ewe is much better than what you can get from a bag um, so with 
with fresh colostrum, it can stay in a fridge up to a week, or you can put it into a freezer for up to a year and it's still good. Um, we like to use ice cube tray because you can have small amounts and thaw it out at, at that way rather than having to thaw out the whole thing. Um, important thing with colostrum from a freezer, to thaw it out, you need to use a warm water bath. Do not put it in the microwave. You will you will break down the the proteins and all the good stuff that that's in that colostrum that that lamb needs. So there's that. Um, and then for a ewe, like if you have a before lambing, if you have a ewe that's seeming sluggish or lethargic or having like head head tremors, um, you know, isn't getting up. Those are signs of pregnancy toxemia. So that means that her energy level, like her nutrients isn't being met. And so her body's creating ketones. Um, so we have some ketone strips you can just buy at your local grocery store. You need to um, check her urine and it will tell you her ketone levels. That's how you know if she has ketosis or not, which is pregnancy toxemia. Um, if she does, you know, you want to get with your vet, a good thing to have on hand would be some propylene glycol. So this is um, like sugar that you can give them. You can give it to them as a drench. Um, you can put m molasses in warm water that they can drink. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's what, that's what you're going to need to do. And there's also a possibility of milk fever, which is low calcium. You can give them some calcium glutinate. Um, either sub-Q or orally, um, and that will correct that as well. So, I mean, the, both of these are really, all three of these actually, are really cheap items you can get from your local farm store. Like this dextrose is $5. Um, this calcium glutinate is $6. You know, so those things to have on hand each year, you know, could save lambs and could save ewes um, just by being observant and having the correct things already with you. Awesome. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> My mind just blew up. There's so much great information there, guys. I know there's a ton, but you can go back and watch this video in slow-mo if you need to, like I will, um, or in double X speed for all you smarty pants out there. But you can rewatch this video as many times as you need to. And bonus tip, sneak peek, guess what? Heifer USA right now is in the process of filming a complete production cycle video that we are probably going to be turning into our first ever online mini course all about raising sheep on pasture. We've been shooting this video for months now uh, throughout the course of the flock that you just saw. Um, everything from breeding to vaccination to rotational grazing, uh, all the different inputs, every single thing that we can possibly think of, we are going to put into this video series for you. So if you're not subscribed to the channel already and you are interested in learning more information about raising sheep, definitely subscribe to the channel so that you can get notified whenever we release that online course um, and any sheep content that we produce here on Heifer Ranch. Um, Christine is going to share with you some more valuable resources on how you can continue your knowledge journey with or without us. And then I am going to give you a couple of links where you can give us some feedback, enter for a chance to win some cool merchandise, and watch that exclusive video that I mentioned earlier in the live stream, which if you're just joining us earlier this year, we were able to finally capture the complete birthing process of a lamb out on pasture. We've tried for years and we finally got it this year. So we're going to share that exclusive video with our live stream audience today. All right. Yeah. What, do you, what do you got? Okay. Um, all sorts of stuff. Okay. <laughs> so now that you're, you know, like your lambs are born, you know, I consider our lambing season over. We may have a few more trickle in within the next few days, but it's an important time to, to make sure you are keeping your records. And so, you want to use your records for who you're going to keep as breeding replacements, who you're going to call, you know, get out of your flock. Um, and you all want, you want to be keeping those records right now as lambing season is going on. That way, you know, in the summertime when you're calling, you're not like, hmm, I remember that number, but, but why do I want to get rid of her sort of thing. Um, so records are really important, you know, monitoring your flock, monitoring your lambs, make sure everyone's staying healthy, that they're not having parasite issues, you know, springtime. Um, is a big parasite time and then also all of our ewes are working extra hard and they you know just had their lambs so their immune systems are a little low it was a stressful time you know they could also be having some parasite issues 
because of those things. And so with that, I would highly recommend if anyone has sheep or goats that you go and you get um, certified with a FAMACHA card. So right now there's online trainings. I think they're starting to do them in person again, but you can go to wormex.com or dot something um, and find out who in your area can train you on a FAMACHA or do it online. Um, the FAMACHA helps you know if your animal is anemic and it gives you um, an idea on if your sheep or goats have the barber pole worm, which is the most common, most prolific, most health causing parasite within small ruminants. Um, so everyone should go and do that. It's easy. It's awesome to have one of these cards on hand. Um, and then a, there's two podcasts that I personally listen to that you should as well. Um, one of them is called Sheep Stuff You, E-W-E, should know. Um, it's with a veterinarian and two sheep farmers out in California. Um, it's a fun listen. And then ASI, which is the American Sheep Industry Association. They also have a podcast out there that's more like scientific um, information for you there. But And then two books that, that I have on hand. I've, I showed other ones during last year's live stream, but I'm showing this one again. So Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. I highly recommend this if you have livestock or not, or you want to get them. I mean, it goes through all the different species, you know, how to safely handle them, how to make sure you're doing it in a humane way, and how to get things set up on your farm for those specific species. So. I just designed a pig handling facility that we're going to have here in one of our pig pastures and I based it off of Temple's book. So um, great read, you can get it off of Amazon. And then um, I just got this one this year but it's Pipestone's Veterinary Guide to Sheep and Goats. I got this from Premier One um, and it's Dr. Kennedy that created this book. He created the Pipestone as well um, but it has all sorts of you know, different different chapters on different things. And it's a really easy read. It's like little essays that he wrote about each of those topics. So um, I have it on my desk. You know, if I have questions about a certain topic, I can just go and reference this as well. Ooh. Bless you. Excuse me. Yeah. All right, cool. And the guys, um, we're gonna put links in the description of this video to all of these things. Everything that we've been talking about from the, the video about the lambing kit to uh, last year's live stream to all of these resources that Christine is sharing. So if you want to find this stuff, just check out the description of this video after the live stream is over. Give us a little bit and we'll type it in there for you. Um, and it will be there and available. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get to one more audience question because we have some more come in and uh, definitely appreciate you guys asking those questions. And then I'm going to share those links with you and turn it over to Christine for any final thoughts. So we got a great question. Uh, from Katie Brown. She asked about that feeding tube that you yeah. showed earlier, the little brown one. Mm -hmm. uh, she wants to know how do you make sure it's not accidentally inserted down the windpipe? How do you put it in the right spot? Okay, so um, you want to hold, I wish I had like a fake lamb I could hold out for you, but if you like hold the lamb, like if you stand up you hold the lamb like between your legs so that its, its bottom end is dangling, you know, and you open its mouth, I tend to just First of all, you should measure where the stomach is on the lamb with this outside of the lamb's body. You can mark it with a marker so you know how far you need to go in till you're in the lamb's stomach. If you go in like too shallow, it's not going to get there. You know, they may choke on it. And, um, you know, if you go too deep, you may like cause pain going into their stomach. But, you know, once you know the distance that this should be going in, um, if you open their mouth and I just kind of, I tap it in there like until I hear them swallowing. So they're, they have a trachea and esophagus. The trachea is going to be hard because, you know, breathing and stuff. Uh, with your esophagus, that's going to be softer. So you should also be able to feel the tube through their neck once it's in there. And then um, making sure that they're swallowing. And then before I administer too much of the, the milk, I'll just do a little bit. And then you can listen to it, you know, and make sure they're not they're not coughing or you don't hear breathing through there. Nice. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and there's a there's a few like YouTube videos out there too that will show you actually how to do it. But those are just some tips. 
Cool. Awesome. All right. Okay, guys. So much information. Christine, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure that we could have stayed for another hour. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you'll be notified next time we go live with Christine Hernandez or one of our other amazing livestock specialists or horticulture specialists here at Heifer USA so you can continue on your learning journey with us. As promised, I'm going to share a couple of links with you in the live chat right now or in the description of the video if you're watching after the fact. The first link we're going to share is to a survey. It's a Google Form survey. It's four or five short, quick questions. And if you would do us a huge favor, we are a nonprofit organization. We are donor funded, and we want to make sure that we are stewarding our donor resp uh, do dollars responsibly, providing the best content for the best value for our viewers and for our audience. So if you would go and click on that link right now, open it up in a new tab or copy and paste it and save it for later. Um, and fill out that survey for us. It would help us tremendously to conduct more of these amazing live streams, in-person events here at Heifer Ranch, and all of the work that we do to support small-scale farmers in the United States practicing regenerative uh, forms of agriculture. And if you enter, or if you complete your survey, we're gonna give away five Heifer USA hats at random. I think there's about 60 people watching this live stream, give or take, and so you got a 10% chance of winning one of these hats right here. Um, and also, if you fill out that survey, we'll add you to our email list so that you get notice, notified when we go live next, when we drop that sheep course, when we publish our next YouTube video, whatever else we're doing. We don't bombard you, we don't spam you, we're not marketing to you, we don't ask for stuff. We're just giving you value whenever we have it. Um, so fill out that survey and that would do us a huge favor and get you added to our email list and entered for a chance to win one of these hats. The second link will be for those of you who are bold enough and would like to see the birthing of a lamb on pasture that we captured earlier this year. So we're gonna put those in the live chat right now. Um, I'm gonna turn it over for Christine for some final thoughts and then I'm gonna to walk toward the lambs one last time for anybody who wants to stick around and try to get a little bit closer to them while you fill out that survey um, or while you're getting ready to watch that other video. Um, and just hang out with me for a few more minutes as I walk over there to them. So Christine, thank you so very much for your time and your knowledge and your wisdom. Uh, any final thoughts? Um, I feel like there's so much more information to give you, but I hope what I did give you, you know, will get you on your way, whether you already have sheep or you want to get sheep. Um, you know, there's always something to learn, always something to change, and you just need to get out there and do it. Um, sheep are awesome. I love them. If you have any other questions or want to know why we do something, you know, just reach out and we will get back to you. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Christine. Fill out that survey. You'll get it on our email list. And uh, let's go get a little closer to some of these sheep and say goodbye to them, too. Hey, sheep. Hey, mom. The real stars of the show, thank you so much for letting us hang out with you today. couple of snoozers. I've been busted, guys. I think that's my cue. They said don't get any closer. All right, thank you everybody for joining us from Heifer USA. I'm Tyler Pearson. Uh, we're going to sign off now. Appreciate you. Fill out that survey, and we'll see you next time that we go live here from Heifer Ranch. I'm going to run for my life now. See ya.